Well, good morning, church. Man, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us in worship. We are just glad to, to worship alongside one another in community, and that's what our series is all about, is life together. Um, my name is Pastor Ryan Moline. I am just one of the pastors here, and it is my joy that we get to continue in this Life Together series as we are asking the question of what does it take to truly do life together as a community in a way that reflects the heart of God. And that's really what we've been centered upon the last few uh, weeks. And it's exciting. We're going to continue by talking about serving together and what that looks like and what that means. Um, But before we get there, everybody, we have homework right now, which is pull out your Connect card. Um, Your Connect card would be in your program or it's in the seat in front of you. And if you pull out that Connect card, that is not... Um, just for an exclusive few, we are inviting everybody to participate in, um, in this if, if you feel led. So the Connect card, if you're new here, we want to um, welcome you here. We want to help connect you with others. Um, we want to pray with you. Um, and so you can share information with us in that, that way. If you're not new here or for everybody, God may be saying something to you. He may be speaking um, uh, speaking something directly to you that you want to share with us that we can pray alongside uh, you with this upcoming week. So have that Connect card handy, and at the end of um, our time together today, you'll have an opportunity to reflect and pray. Maybe there's some way specifically that God wants you to take a next step, and and we'd love to partner with you in that. So um, have that at the ready. Feel free to jot notes down on that, and you'll be able to put that in the offering um, later on in the service. So have any of you ever faced uh, a situation where you're like, you had an individual task, and um, when you finish it, you realize, like, there were a lot of big players that um, were involved in, like, the completion of the task, right? So it might have been, like, I was the only one that cared about this, but you needed other people in order to make that thing happen. I had, I had a task like that. Um, we have a Ford Fusion, a 2012 Ford Fusion, and I had, a long time ago, we had busted the front end, and it was all cracked and stuff, and it was only getting worse, and after the very smart ways of fixing it with Gorilla Glue, we figured that was not working anymore, and it was getting worse, and we realized we had to do something about it if we didn't want, like, the whole front end just to kind of, like, splinter around the road later on. So, um, it was like a huge fix, and I didn't want to pay the thousand bucks to have this thing replaced. And so my dad had said, well, why don't you go ahead and order this part? Like, if you order it, I bet you could put it on, you know, and you just need to find somebody that can paint it. They can do a good job. They can match it. You could save yourself a lot of money. So my dad helped me figure out where do you do that, because I was fairly intimidated of ordering a couple hundred dollar part for my car in the first place. Then other people had to help me find the guy that could paint this, um, because a lot of people have guys that can do things. I don't. So I needed to find the guys that have the guys that can do things. And so um, I had to then rely on some other people that could help me out in that way, help me find that guy who could paint my uh, front bumper assembly. And then I got it back. And then I had to rely on good old YouTube. I don't know, like whenever I have a problem, I'm just like, somebody probably filmed themselves doing it. So I... I had YouTube, a guy I've never met, help me learn how to take this part off my car. So thank you to that guy. Funny story is the first like two minutes of the video were upside down. And then he like apologized in the, he's like, hey, it's still good content, but it's upside down. Um, It was very dizzying. But all that to say, then I'm in this project and I'm working on this part and you have to remove all these old pieces from the old bumper to put it on the new bumper. And so I'm trying to remove those without breaking them, and they're all fastened differently, and it's all way above my pay grade. And I am overwhelmed realizing that, like, you take the whole front end of the car off, basically, like all the plastic garbage around it. You have to take it all off to get to this one part. And uh, I'm looking at my car, and I'm looking at the parts that I have all on, and I'm like, oh, this is a bad choice. I should have paid the thousand bucks. And and so I'm feeling helpless, but a guy I knew happened to be riding his bike— saw me, probably thought, that might be the most pathetic thing I've seen today. And he ended up stopping, and he's super mechanical. And within a few minutes, he helped me solve several things that I could not figure out. And he actually helped me with a few projects that I think, really, after we did it, I realized, like, oh, we kind of needed an extra set of hands maybe anyway. So um, I ended up finishing the project. 
It looks nice. If you see me driving around, just like be like, wow, he did a good job. I do not do that, though, for other people. Uh, it was not time efficient. But I would have been still working on this car now if it wasn't for other people stepping in and offering me up the expertise that they had and in serving alongside of me. I mean, nobody else cared about this part being put on my car. But it showed me that community can really make a huge difference when we're set with doing something, um, trying to accomplish a goal. And that story kind of serves as a launching pad for Nehemiah. Um, many of us might be familiar with the story of Nehemiah. Um, it's often paired with the stories in Ezra, and those two books are great pictures of res restoration and redemption of God's like promises and covenant. And the part of Nehemiah we're going to focus on is, um, is a part that's about the rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall. And this is several hundred years before Jesus comes. Um, but Nehemiah, he was, in a, he was not in Jerusalem when God calls him to come and fix this wall, to rebuild it. He's far, far away. And he, uh, he gets this call from God, hey, you know about this wall that's in shambles. It's time to go fix it. He got a blessing from the king who gave him things that would help him gather resources that he would need for the rebuilding of the wall. And he sets on his journey. And it's something like, I, I've read it, it was something like a five-month journey. I mean, this was not like a hop in your Uber and like you're there. So like he takes a big risk, packs it up, and goes to Jerusalem, and he's going to rebuild this wall. He doesn't know what the state of the wall is. He has no idea. He just knows that God sent me on this mission. So he gets there, and in chapter, Nehemiah chapter 2, we see that um, he is— Verse 11, it's showing, talking about him in the secret of the night, in the quiet of the night, in the darkness of the night, he is inspecting the wall. And he's doing it because he doesn't really, nobody really knows why he's there. Um, and he hasn't made it known yet. There's a little tentativeness on his part of sharing that because I think he knows that opposition is coming his way. I mean, he's journeyed this distance, not with the promise that he will just meet a bunch of people that like know what what he's going to need, but just with the promise, like, this is what God wants you to do, so go. And so he's stepping into this place. He's inspecting the wall. Imagine how bad the wall would have had to have been for him in the nighttime without the flashlight on his iPhone to be able to see this wall, right? That's a joke. There is no iPhone back in the day, okay? Cool. Um, so it had to have been pretty bad, right? Like, so he's inspecting this wall, um, it was about two miles around. It's like eight feet wide, 10 gates to it. There's towers involved. We're talking about legit stuff, right? Not just like a little garden wall. We're talking a wall for a city. So he's inspecting this. He eventually, he understands this is what I'm called to do. This is that we are supposed to rebuild this wall. I need to share what God's sharing with me with other people. And so in verse 17, actually I skipped. Verse 16, we're going to see... Um, he, he confesses that he doesn't think he'll be well-received by some people. Because in verse 16, he says, the officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the good work. So Nehemiah knows that he's not going to have just a bunch of people on his side necessarily. And so then if we jump to verse 17, we see, though, he's convinced that he's still got to share this mission. He's still got to invite other people to the cause that God's calling him to because he knows that it's not just his mission to rebuild this wall. So in verse 17, Nehemiah then said to the people in Jerusalem, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said. Because if you remember mentioning uh, the king had blessed Nehemiah um, by providing him, like, basically connections. He provided him with the guys that he would need as far as who's got the stone or who's got whatever. So um, he shares with the people, like, God's already got a hand in this. And then the people's response, a lot of them say, let's start rebuilding. So they began that good work. 
But when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and they ridiculed us. This is what Nehemiah is saying. And this is important because actually a few verses earlier, there's already those people along with other nobles and officials had already been kind of unsettled and disturbed that Nehemiah had even come. They were like, what's this guy doing here? And now they're learning what he's doing there and they're not okay with it. And so uh, they start asking the question, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is kind of an overwhelming part of the story. Because, I mean, picture where Nehemiah's journeyed to this point. He's journeyed for several months to go rebuild the wall he had not seen, that he had just known about. Like, hey, this has been a thing. Long time ago, wall, gone. God's ready to restore this. I'm going to journey to a place where I know not everybody's going to receive me well. I'm going to inspect the conditions without much support. Yet Nehemiah still chooses to continue in what God had laid before him. And we have a little chart that actually shows, um, yeah, there it is. Dungate, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. It's bottom left right there, for those of you who wanted to know that. Um, But it's like two miles around, and we're talking about like 10 different gates. You notice there's some towers. um, And like this is a big wall. It's like eight feet wide or eight feet thick. Um, And the gates, I mean, it's not like a gate. Like, their gates were very elaborate and involved a lot to it. So this wall, they're going to rebuild, right? Um, But I think Nehemiah understood God is concerned with all aspects of human life and is committed to community. And the reason we we see that in this story is because why else would he have journeyed this whole way? He had to have known it's not you alone rebuilding this wall. But he didn't have a list of here's who's going to help you. So he stepped in faith into understanding that God was going to restore this wall and in, in a sense teach them about restored promises and a restored covenant, and he was going to supply him with what he needed. He had to have known that. So Nehemiah traversed all those miles, and he's stepping into obedience. And notice a few things about the recruitment of his volunteers. Um, just for fun. We'll say volunteers. That's what we like saying in church. So recruitment of his volunteers, right? He first in verse 17, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't start like going on side tangents. He tells them first, look, it's all in ruins. Like you can see this. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Isn't it time to start rebuilding? Like, so he makes people aware. This is the reality. The reality is a brokenness here. But you can tell that God is already in this thing. He's ready to restore. Why? Well, let me share. God has already worked through the king in providing us some of what we need. So he talks about the hand of God then. Never does Nehemiah say, I have this plan. I have this dream. He's pointing to the work that God's already doing, and he's showing people what that is. And so Nehemiah is not pointing to himself. Instead, he's remembering that God's solution is what matters, not his personal plan. And that's really important because sometimes we get driven by what do I want. I get driven by that a lot. Instead of sitting in what is it that God wants and realizing how am I being obedient to what God wants. And notice, not everybody, when he's recruiting his volunteers, when he's sharing this vision that God's cast for him, not everybody receives him well. He's mocked, he's ridiculed, he's faced with people that are ready to oppose this work. But didn't Jesus experience that opposition too? I mean, Luke chapter 4, his own people rejected him. In Luke chapter 4, he's preaching Jesus of Nazareth, his own people hear him and reject him. It says in uh, Luke 4, 24, Jesus is preaching. He says, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And he would go on to say a few more words that don't make them too happy. And in verse 28, we see their response to him. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. 
Jesus himself experienced rejection, not just the rejection we know of on the cross, but in his life in ministry, as he was living a life of obedience to the will of the Father, Jesus was constantly interacting with opposition and rejection. And so we get this picture of Jesus and what he faced, but then we see Nehemiah, he's embodying that too. He's giving us a picture of what it looks like to walk in the way of, of, of the Lord, even though you might not be well received by all. And then in Nehemiah chapter 3, I'm guessing nobody did devos in Nehemiah chapter 3 this week. It is pretty boring. It is legit just the details of the wall being rebuilt. So maybe a few of you spent some good quality time in Nehemiah chapter 3, but I have found it often to be a chapter that I kind of like scoot on through really quickly. But it's so important to this whole story. Because in Nehemiah chapter 3, we see what the high priest's role were, was, and we see what the priest's role was, and we see what individuals and groups and families and nobles, what their roles were. As people were saying, yeah, Nehemiah, let's start rebuilding. They all had roles on the wall, on the towers, on the gates. And that's important because I think it shows us that God understands there are details God is in the details. God is sharing those details with us. Why is it even in the Bible? It feels uninspired. I think it's in the Bible because it teaches us that, that God understands. It teaches us that Nehemiah was faced with a huge task. And remember, I said we were going to talk about the dung gate. People worked on the dung gate. That needed to be repaired too. I don't know what a dung gate is. I don't love the word dung, right? Like, who's signing up for that? I would like to sign up for anything but the dung gate. Yet the Bible doesn't, like, doesn't categorize the work on the wall. If you notice in chapter 3, there's nothing that's like, I mean, people had certain roles they had to play. The high priest had to play a certain role. But it's not categorizing, like, this is what really mattered for the wall to get rebuilt, and this is what kind of mattered, and this was just, uh, it happened. They all play a role in this wall getting rebuilt. They all mattered. The dung gate mattered. And too often, we belittle things that maybe God is calling us to because we think, well, that's less important. But if it's within the mission of God, if it is something God is calling you to, then it matters just as much as anything else. And that's why chapter 3 matters. God cares. And what's amazing is this wall was rebuilt in 52 days. Two miles around. Must have been in shambles. Ten gates. Towers everywhere. It's insane. This wall gets rebuilt in 52 days. And chapter 3 tells us that 40 different people, over 40 different families and individuals were involved. And we see all these different people and the roles they had to play. And this incredible thing was done. And what does that teach us? It teaches us that a committed community can accomplish great things for God. I mean, Nehemiah on his own, who in the world would think that he could ever get that done? I mean, really, could he have rebuilt the wall on his own? as people mocked and ridiculed him. I mean, I guess, maybe. But that, notice that wasn't what God's plan was. And Nehemiah didn't also just have like a buddy that was certified in rebuilding walls alongside him that worked with it. He had a whole crew, a whole crew of people that when they heard this message from God that was delivered through Nehemiah about the rebuilding of this wall, that people were saying, yep, sign me up. And some of them ended up working on the dung gate. And it mattered. It mattered the same amount. It mattered just as much as anything else. And we're not just talking about rebuilding walls today, because we have a command we read earlier uh, from Jesus. Um, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus is ascending to heaven, and before he leaves his disciples with some key words, he says in verse 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our marching orders from Jesus 
This is like the speech Nehemiah gave. Jesus is making it clear as day that every single person that is claiming to follow Jesus, every single person is responsible for sharing the good news of Jesus. Every single person plays a role in the praise and glory and honor that needs to be given to the Lord. Everybody plays a role. I mean, how crazy would it have been if people were like, yeah, Nehemiah, that is a great plan to rebuild that wall. I think you should do it. And a bunch of people just sat down and watched him rebuild the wall. Yep, I think he should do it. And then a few weeks go by, hey, why is this wall? It doesn't look like much progress has been made, you know? Like, you got a couple, couple stones down. You haven't even gotten to the dung gate. Like, Nehemiah, what are you doing? That would have been silly. No, people were called to respond to what God was saying to them too. And we do that same thing in church all the time. We say, why is it that nobody's teaching kids? People should, kids should learn about Jesus. Somebody should do something about that. Well, maybe Jesus is laying that on your heart because he's calling you to that. I know all the time I have a critical heart that I have to battle all the time. And all the time I'm faced with these, why isn't somebody doing something about that? Or, man, people should really talk to that person about Jesus and let them know. Um, people should invite that, that, uh, that friend to church. Or, yeah, that's a great idea. But it's always falling in somebody else's problem. Well, we look no different than somebody who's like, yeah, I think the wall should get rebuilt. Go for it. We look no different. Because the command from Jesus is, therefore, go. Make disciples. Baptize them. Teach everybody to obey everything I've commanded. You're included in that which is scary. If I'm being honest, I'm scared by that because I start realizing there feels like a lot of pressure because now I realize there's no throwaway day, people, conversations, moments. When I'm following Jesus, he is calling me to obedience in everything in all situations. Not that I'm not going to mess up, but I start realizing there's pressure in that. That somebody needs to do something about that person that doesn't feel loved that somebody is probably me. That somebody that needs to do something about those teens that need to have mentors in their life, that somebody might be me. So all of a sudden, everything matters. But isn't it also exciting? Because if everything matters to Jesus, I don't have to buy into this lie that my role that God's calling me to is less significant than the role that somebody else is called to. If God is calling me to help greet at doors and make people feel welcome in the church, then there is no better, more significant place that I should be than at a door making sure people feel welcome. If God is calling me to serve by loving families in a nursery and making sure these kids from the very beginning feel loved by Jesus, then there's no place I should be except for responding in faithfulness to that. If God is calling me to lead in some massive way that feels so overwhelming, there's no place I should be except for there. That matters. And that's exciting. It's exciting because it means Jesus wants to use you. It's exciting because we are called to see things reach restoration and completion in the same way as they were with the rebuilding of this wall. So, go ahead and take the uh, Connect card out. Maybe you've kept it out, which, hey, that is a really good choice. Um, this Connect card is a, is a great way to maybe, maybe Jesus has been saying something to you for a long while, and you're like, oh, man, it's, I want to respond. And let me be clear, I'm not making a volunteer pitch in the church. That would be tragic if, if we were just pointing at what we want and, sorry about the lights, um, it'd be tragic if, if that's what this whole thing ended at. It could be something within the church walls. But let's be clear, obedience to Jesus involves everything, right? And so you might be like, God is telling me specifically, it is time to invite this neighbor over for coffee right? Is there any way we can just shut those off? I, they're glitching on them. They're not doing that intentionally. 
Maybe Jesus is calling you to a specific person that you're supposed to love and care for and minister to, right? But maybe, maybe he's calling you to volunteer in a certain way in the church walls or in the community or something. And, and you could claim that on the Connect card, which would be awesome. And we'd love to partner with you in prayer. So go ahead and um, the ushers are going to come forward and we're going to walk into a time of prayer. Um, and fill out the Connect card. If you don't get it filled out in time, you can go and there are boxes on your way out. You can drop them in too. But the time of offering is a time where we offer all that we have, all that we can do, all that God's given us. And um, you might be faithfully giving online through text or something. This is still a time of worship. This is a time where you offer that up. Maybe God is calling you to release something new or something else. Um, so would you just join with me in praying as we ask God for the wisdom of where he wants us? Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we want to use us. We thank you that there is no role that we fill within the body of believers that is insignificant or less significant than something else. That everything when we obey you matters to you deeply. We pray against any of the onlys, the things that make people think, I'm only this, I'm only playing this role, I'm only serving in this way. We pray that you would attack those lies that try to tear at the significance of the work of the kingdom of God. And we pray that this morning would be filled with people that are saying, I am called to this. I'm ready. So we offer all that we have and all that we can do to you. We love you, Lord. Amen.